Good evening, Tapu Steen. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I gave my presentation a fancy title, but I promise I'm going to talk more about cyber than I would have talked about money. But uh, my talk is going to be about ransomware. Um, briefly about me, I'm a local guy. Uh, grew up, uh, spent most of my life here in Pristina, uh, and then moved to Norway uh, six, seven years ago. I have a bachelor's from uh, University of Pristina here, a computer engineer by background, and then specialized in cybersecurity, have a master's in information security. Um, I have more than five years of working experience. I uh, started as a software developer and then slowly moved to, moved to security. Um, I'm a consultant in KPMG, uh, which means uh, we do a lot of things within security, uh, but I specialize in incident response and threat intelligence. Uh, I'm going to explain briefly what they mean uh, later on, but uh, if you see me at a company, usually it's either too, too good or too bad. It's either a positive news or a negative news. There, uh, there is no neutral in between. Uh, so either the company is doing really good and trying to be proactive, or the company has been hacked. Um, how to reach out to me? I'm on almost every social media out there, uh, but professionally I, I like LinkedIn. So if you want to reach out, let's be friends on LinkedIn and we can learn a lot from each other. Um, I want to start my presentation by, by this famous quote from one of the uh, Greek philosophers that says, uh, the only constant in life is change. Uh, and this, this is very much true about all the fields of technology, but also true about cybersecurity. Uh, we are living in a world where uh, things are changing a lot. They're changing constantly. Uh, things are becoming more complex. Um, in the very beginning of, of technology, if you will, in internet and computers, uh, not that many people, if any, talked about security. Security was not the thing. Technology was built by having functionality as a design. So it was a tool to, uh, utilize to, to facilitate our daily life, but not that many thought about security. Uh, as years pass by, and as we can see even today, uh, security, cybersecurity is a really important topic. And as we can see with the, with the events in Ukraine, also with the pandemic, uh, cyber is something we have to take care of really carefully. Um, in the beginning, we had concepts like perimeter security and security for those that I remember, which assumed that everything within our yard, everything without, within our house is trusted, anything else is not. And we try to protect our environment by just assuming that everything inside is, is trusted. Uh, that worked for some years, but it doesn't work anymore. It's not effective anymore. Uh, you cannot longer just think about ourselves where most of our data is in the cloud and we have a little to no control of the cloud. Uh, we cannot think just about to ourselves uh, when we have vendors, suppliers that we have no control. Uh, simply, the, the situation today is way more complex, so we cannot think about traditional approaches. That's why we had one of our talks today. We have zero trust today and all those advancements. But as things advance, so does the threat actor, so that the hackers also advance. So how do we keep up with all these changes and make sure that we are we're protected? Uh, one of the f uh, ways to do this is through the so-called cyber threat intelligence, uh, which is a field or a domain in cybersecurity uh, adopted by the military, the, the intelligence services. You have all seen the, the movies, the CIA movies. So the concept is adapted from, from there. Uh, it's known as a, as a field for quite a long, but it got its momentum around 2008, uh, 10, after this uh, big Chinese operation called Aurora, a lot of companies started to investigate the, uh, the, the hack there and started also to share, to share intelligence with the community. And that's when they realized, uh, wait a bit, uh, the best intelligence is the, w is the one you get uh, after an incident response and not something that you'll find in the intelligence agencies somewhere in a safe deposit. Um, well, there's a lot of definition about this, but basically it's information which is processed, validated, and then when it's put in the right context, it's going to help you to uh, protect your, uh, a harmful, uh, from a harmful event. Uh, personally, I put this slide here because I'm a huge fan believer of the concept that is called cyber threat intelligence informed cybersecurity services in general. So basically the best defense is the one that... Uh, is driven by understanding the threat actors, these these hackers. That's the best way to do. And this can be this can be applied to all the fields of cybersecurity. 
whether that's just security training, that's whether that's risk management, whether that's in incident response uh, detection, penetration testing, etc. So everything that is, you have all the recent updates from from the uh, threat actors itself. Uh, one of those things that I want to update you today is an attack that is called ransomware. Uh, I assume most of you uh, know what ransomware is, but uh, briefly, it's a piece of software that encrypts your files and renders them unavailable, and in, uh, it requires a demand, uh, demands a, a ransom in order to, to get access back to the files. Um, as a concept, is by no means new. Uh, it has existed since at least uh, 1989, uh, when in a conference like this, organized by the World Health Organization, uh, one smart guy there decided to uh, spread ransomware to around 20,000 researchers uh, via floppy disk. Uh, we're talking more than 30 years ago. By no means, that was no, not sophisticated. Uh, for those that are into cryptography, that was uh, symmetric encryption, easy to decrypt. But yet again, this is way 30-something years ago. And uh, also, the demand for, for ransom was pretty low compared to today. It was around $200. But this is the event that uh, we use as a starting point for ransomware. Uh, for a period, then things were a bit quiet, not that much going on until uh, 2010 when hackers, I, I like to call them threat actors, started using this fire and forget method, which is basically automate your attack as much as possible, uh, target as many victims as you can, and maybe some of them will fall. Um, it worked to some degree, but yet again, there was no customization there. You were just trying to target all the companies in the world. Uh, the ransom demands were not that high, so Ransomware was not known yet in this period. Uh, going back, going further into 2015, these groups then realized you need some sort of hands-on activity uh, in order to succeed. You need some sort of customization. That's when we started the, uh, the period that's called post-intrusion ransomware, when they started to use a command and control server to, to give commands and receive from the actual environment that they have been hacking to. Uh, of course, it meant the, the, the attacks were more successful, but also you could target less companies as you needed more hands-on people. Um, and then we go to maybe the biggest development in ransomware, which I'm going to talk about uh, briefly right now, which is ransomware as a service. When these uh, cyber criminals realized, well, why don't we just operate like a normal business does? Uh, no company in the world operates alone. They do delegate parts of their operation to others. They have partners, they have suppliers, so why shouldn't we do the same in, in cyber community as well? So this is uh, ransomware as a services. Basically, they have subcontractors, they delegate part of uh, their attack to others, and then get the revenue. Um, this, of course, means that the, the big bosses, they're going to be away from the actual operations, less likely to be caught from the legal environment uh, agencies, and therefore, the more likely that they're going to be uh, working for longer periods of time. And lastly, uh, which is the period that we today call us uh, name and shame, in the last two, three years, ransomware groups became even smarter and they said, well, wait, we're just encrypting the data. Why, do you, why don't we steal first and, and see what happens? So they're, uh, they're demanding uh, payment for both to decrypt the data and also uh, uh, to not release them. Uh, there was some question about GDPR. In the morning, this is when GDPR comes into question. One of the reasons why they're stealing the data is that the companies have more pressure to pay the ransom because of the data leakages. Um, back to the movies. Uh, if you watch movies with, uh, with hackers, with, with attackers, basically, they're single men working in the basement wearing hoodies far from reality. Uh, this picture shows an entire ecosystem, so all the main actors uh, that work in a, a ransomware group, with the main guys being the so-called ransomware as a service operators. These are the top management of a company. Uh, these are the, the big bosses. Um, like any other company, they have their own departments. Oops. Uh, they have a development team, so it's the people that actually develop the code and make sure that they're undetectable, as sophisticated, as destructive as possible. Of course, they also have the testing team, which makes sure that th things run normally. They have an HR department. They do recruitment. Those people are just people at the end of the day. They have Christmas. Uh, they take vacation. So, of course, they have to apply to the HR department for, to 
take vacation, they have a finance department dealing with finances, and so on and so on, basically like a normal company. They have an IT, so that I just forgot, no company can exist with an IT. They need infra infrastructure, they need servers, they need websites, they need everything else, so they have a department for that as well. Uh, but what makes the difference here is that the next two actors, with the first one being initial access brokers, which is a uh, sub, uh, subset of groups, so a smaller group specialized in just one thing, uh, which is getting initial access into an environment, a company, and then selling that access to, to the bigger guys. There are some that choose to, to work just with, with one ransomware group, the others that just sell it to everyone they can, basically make as much money as you can. Um, the next, uh, which is affiliates, uh, also a subgroup of criminals, but now specializing in the other part of an attack. So initial access brokers get the access, affiliates are those that actually perform the attack. These are the people that deploy the ransomware. Uh, as you can see, these people, operators, they're far back, through. they're not in the battlefield. So they're, if one affiliate gets caught, affiliate group, if they got caught to the police, they basically just replace them and they keep going their operation as normal. Uh, two other concepts, negotiators, um, after they, they ask for, for a ransom, usually companies refuse to, to, to pay, but if they do pay, they want to negotiate, so they don't pay the whole sum. So they have people that actually are good with negotiating and paying in Bitcoin and you know those techno tec uh, technicalities that, that should be done. And lastly, but not the least, money launderer. Uh, these people make millions, if not billions, and they have to do something with the money. So they have specialized piece, people that do, do the money laundering. So as you can see, uh, far away from, from the movies, from away from a single man, these, these organizations, if I call, call them, have hundreds of employees on, on their payroll. Um, this is just a demonstration on how, how the actually initial access brokers work and how we see could actually monitor the operations. We could have prevented certain attacks. Um, <coughs> on the left side, you, you see a timeline of uh, February 16 last year. Uh, some initial access broker says that uh, they were selling access to a billion dollar um, industry. Uh, it was, as you can see here, it's just, I guess it's hard to see, it's in Russian, but it says RDP and one million, and then you have the cost over there. Two days later, the, the access was sold. Uh, another two days uh, later, this ransomware group called DarkSide uh, claims to have compromised this American company called Gyrodata, which then days later confirmed that they were compromised between 16th and uh, 22nd of uh, February 2021. I haven't analyzed this, but I, belove, uh, I believe that the source that I got it from, but I imagine if this initial access broker uh, was monitored there and the company actually would do something to, to, to block this access. Uh, and again, it shows how effective they are within a day and they get access, deploy ransomware and whatnot. Uh, some numbers for those that are fans of. On the left side, uh, I've put uh, the numbers of victims uh, for the last year. And when I say number of victims, it's the companies that refuse to pay and the, their data was leaked on those extortion sites. So ransomware groups have these extortion sites where they uh, leak the data if the companies fail to pay. Uh, it's a long list of their top three ransomware groups at least by the number of victims in these sites for last year were uh, Paisa, Logbit, and, and Conti. If you do the math, these three combined have more than 1,000 uh, victims on, on, those, on those extortion sites. And the total number for last year, at least some of the main groups, is more than 2,500 uh, victims. Uh, one can just imagine that maybe the ma majority of the victims refuse to pay. Uh, so the number of uh, victims of ransomware is even higher. On the, on the other side, you see the same numbers, uh, but divided by the time uh, on the last two years, 20, January 2020 to December 2021. As you can see, the number of victims initially was relatively low, and then around June, July, something happened, and the number is high since, and it's not expected to, to, to lower it down. And, um, you can maybe imagine what happened back then is, is the famous corona happened and uh, 
Again, anything, any global event that's going to happen uh, in the world, it's going to affect the cyber criminals. Uh, all of a sudden, companies were forced to have their workforce working remotely, open some ports, expose some services. And they did this in a sort of uncontrolled manner. Let's just give this guy um, RDP access to this server. He's going to work from home. He works in IT. We know him. He needs that access. But this led to to increase the number of ransomware attacks uh, worldwide. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see it, but I'll continue with the numbers briefly, how much ransomware, how much companies pay in ransom. Um, they are the data for two years. And of course, the ransom payments depend, uh, depend on also on the size of a company, on, on location and, and all whatnot. But in average, at least for, for last year, 2021, companies paid around half a million dollar in ransom. Of course, uh, this is not the actual amount that th these groups were asking for. So usually you're able to negotiate these terms. But um, one can see that if you compare these numbers to a year before, the numbers are actually doubling uh, year by year. On the right side, you just see some of the most known attacks, ransomware attacks, uh, for the last year. And the amount of money that the com actually companies paid, and you see there 50 million, 40 million, 11 million. Uh, you do your math, a, s a few such attacks per year for these groups, and you see how fast they reach, uh, will reach a billion dollars in revenue. I wish you could see this, but uh, Daniel, we had this discussion about ethics of these groups and how they work and how much actually these people that work in these ransom groups know what they're doing. And uh, even though you don't see this, this is from Conti, one of the, it was on the top of that list. Uh, the, it's, it's, a, it's a group that's believed to be operating with or with link to Russia. Um, and this group decided to take, uh, to take a stand when the war in Ukraine started and they said they will be supporting Ukraine. Uh, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately for them, they had one Ukrainian team member, uh, which didn't like what their bosses were doing, so he decided, or she, uh, to leak all their data, especially chats. And for us researchers, that's a gold mine. We were <laughs> that's what we wanted to understand how these people actually operate. And one of the things that you could have seen in this slide is how the HR talks to a potential uh, guy that they were recruiting, and they say, "Do you know what we do?" And uh, uh, Basically, the guy saying, well, not exactly, but something that it's not completely legal. And basically, they know that they're working something illegal, that is illegal. But I don't think, at least the smaller fish, I don't really know they know the extent of the work they're doing. Basically, they're being hired by a company that says, well, we need this big, uh, strong encryption. And it's not completely legal. But I don't think these people go further into analyzing what they're, what they're actually doing. Um, the same group also, the management is not that transparent Transparent to, to the employees, same to most of the companies there are. And you see chats of people talking with each other saying, wait, we're using the same tool as this other group, aren't we the, aren't we the same? Uh, so there is a lot of question and discussion here, but uh, a lot of these people, uh, some of these groups work by fixed amount of money or percentage. Uh, some, are, some others just get paid by a fixed salary. Uh, for example, for Conti, there, were a lot, there are a lot of sources that say this, these people get paid at $2,000 per, per month. Uh, in Russia, that's quite a lot of a good salary. Uh, anyway, um, my goal was to, just to get you familiar with, with the ransomware attack and why it's relevant and why it's working today. So uh, part other part of my job is the incident response. Uh, this is when people actually don't like, or companies don't like seeing people like me. It means that uh, shit has hit, uh, hit the fan, so it means the company is hacked and they have no idea what you're doing, and they, they call people like me. Um, I'm going to go briefly through the whole process and give you some, some of my personal advice or experience. I'll start with preparation. I've, I've left a slide in, in uh, we had a question what to do if you're hit with by, by ransomware to prevent for, from ransomware. Uh, but the first phase is preparation and usually it's the phase that get neglected the most is basically what to you do to make sure that 
do you prevent such attacks, but also what do you do to make sure that uh, you respond to them in the most effective way should they happen. Um, I'll, I'll go into more details in the others. A detection is how do you know that you have been infected with ransomware. Um, ransomware is pretty verbose, I would say, as an attack, and you will realize pretty fast that you have been attacked by ransomware. Uh, basically, it's Friday afternoon. Uh, people want to send their lost emails or do their lost notification on their files, and all of a sudden, things stop working. That's one way to do it. And of course, the IT department gets a lot of calls. Things are not working. Website is down. This and that. So that's, that's one way of doing it. Uh, another way is through ransom notes. Uh, these groups um, put some files on these compromised environments when they give details about, about the attack. And they say, you should pay this amount into this account, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's one way, another way of knowing that you have been a victim of ransomware. The third one here is just ideal case, you have some detection rules in place, and those detection rules trigger, uh, let's say, you have a detection rule that's going to trigger an alarm that if your exchange or email server is going to all of a sudden send 10 gigabytes of data to an IP in Russia, you have no IP business in Russia, why should the email uh, server be communicating to, to Russia? And then you start investigating, and at some point you realize that uh, you're going to be, you have been a target of ransomware. Uh, analysis, um, this has two main goals. Uh, and the first one is to know what kind of uh, ransomware uh, variant has you been hacked with. You know, there are a lot of variants, a lot of groups. All of them have their own uh, uniqueness. Uh, knowing how to re respond, it's also based on knowing what you're responding to. Uh, so the first thing you do is know what kind of ransomware you're talking about usually if you see the file extensions of the files that have been encrypted, you're going to do some Googling. Uh, within seconds, you're going to know what kind of ransomware variant are we talking about. Um, the second phase is determined how we ended up there, doing some initial root cause analysis. Um, there are a lot of ways these hackers could get in, but uh, um, I've listed here four scenarios. Uh, with the three first three one being uh, internet exposed services, um, and the first two have valid credentials as the way in. You can either do phishing to get valid credentials, or do password cracking, or guessing as it's called, or you can even buy those uh, credentials somewhere on the dark web. Uh, the, the third one is a vulnerability in those exposed services, unpassed vulnerability. And the last one there is just basically you have a phishing email with a malicious attachment then which is dropped as a malware in the environment. Of course, there are other ways. These are just examples. But it's important to know when you're investigating to try to understand what kind of initial root cause you're talking about. It's not always easy. Sometimes you will never find the answer. You have no maybe time and budget to go back in time and try to figure out those things. Uh, but that this is the purpose of these uh, phase. The next three phases, which are usually grouped together, is uh, first one is containment, which is uh, stopping the bleeding. If you're talking in the physical world, you have, let's say, a car accident, the ER services go there, and the first thing they do is, well, they, they quickly realize what's going on and stop, try to stop the bleeding of a patient, otherwise the patient is going to simply die. So this is the phase when you try stopping the ransomware from spreading further in your infrastructure. Uh, just because part of your infrastructure is infected, it doesn't mean that your whole infrastructure is infected. So try to isolate whatever you can. Uh, this is also the phase when a lot of people make mistakes. So if I ask you what do you do if you're sure that your computer is hacked, I'm pretty sure most of you are going to say, well, let's unplug the cable, shut down the computer. Well, that's a way of doing it. Uh, definitely not the way that we recommend to our clients. Uh, by doing so, you're going to lose a lot of artifacts that you're going to help you in the next phases. You're going to uh, lose all the data that is in mem memory. You might have the encryption key in, in memory. Uh, you lose, there are a lot of malware that runs just in memory. So you, lose a lot, you lose a lot of data from memory. You lose a lot of data from, from the network. So basically, don't unplug the cable unless someone that knows what they're doing says to do so. The best way to do this is just disconnect all the infected devices from the internet. Of course, a lot of practicalities there. This is where 
uh, network segmentation comes into place in ideal case when your environment has uh, different zones and you know that one zone is disconnected, you have one switch and then you go and unplug the switch. But of course in practice, not only here but all over the world companies are not are not that advanced yet that you know, you're going to see a lot of things and you have to do a lot of tweak in there and try to come with the best, best output there. This is critical phase, this is time sensitive, this is the phase when everyone starts yelling at you, they have no idea what they're doing, um, especially big bosses that have no idea about technology, the decision makers, you're like, we want to be back, our services have to be back, our website has to be back, sure, but we need to, well, we has to be, so this is really the stressful situation there, uh, so you have to be quite patient with those people and try to explain to them that things have to wait. Uh, the next one is eradication. You know which systems are infected, you know ransomware. You have to make sure that you start removing the ransomware from the infected systems and you have to make sure that you remove the ransomware from all the infected systems, whether that's systems in the cloud, endpoints, servers, whatnot. It can be a lengthy process, but it has to be done. And last phase within this phase is uh, recovery, going back to normal. Uh, this is when companies ask, should we pay the ransom? And we say no, but then they don't have backups. But we tell, tell them, why don't you have backups? But it's actually too, too late to talk about why they don't have and what they do have. And they're like, well, we'll do what we can. Ideal scenario, if they have backups, we just need to make sure that the backups itself are not infected. We restore from the, uh, from the backups, that's ideal. Another one is if you could find a decryption tool, if you could de decrypt the algorithm, that's another way. The other one is basically do nothing, get a clean OS, uh, hope for the best. And the last one is pay the ransom. I hope you never get to that stage, but that's a way to do it. The last phase also often ignored, lesson learned. Companies got hacked, they investigate the ransomware somehow pay a lot of millions and they're happy with it because you're back to the operations. They never sit to discuss, did we actually do it well? Did we pay too much? Did we need, do we need something more? What can we learn from this? They just keep going the, the old way and of course things can happen again. So lesson learned, it's not just a phase that you learn in the books. In practice it's really important to make sure that uh, things don't, don't happen again in the future. I left the slide for the end as I was not sure how much time I have and I have no idea how much time I spend. But uh, when it comes to preparation, the most important phase maybe there are a lot of things you can do and a lot of those things are pretty simple. There's no artificial intelligence there. It's just simple cyber hygiene. If you go back to the days with Corona, a lot of controls, but at the end of the day, they were like, do your hygiene, make sure you clean your hands. Uh, we, we say the same thing to the digital world as well. Do some cyber hygiene. First, control their asset inventory. Know what you have, where you have it, who's the owner, what is it used for. Just imagine you're investigating a ransomware. And where do you start? Which servers do you start, you start investigating first? If I go to your company and ask where should I start, and you have no idea, you don't even have an Excel list that tells me all the servers and what they do, I'm going to pick something, most likely it's going to be fine, but I would rather have you know what you have because you are the owner of uh, your infrastructure. Uh, the second one, patching, a good amount of these attacks happen because of uh, vulnerabilities. Yet again, it's easy, but not so. A lot of companies have vulnerabilities that are years old, simply don't have time or, I don't know, the resources are simply there is a lot of vulnerabilities that are being exploited. Modern policy, password policy. Yeah, you all know what a strong password is. Yet again, in practice, uh, this doesn't apply maybe to IT, as the IT wants to have admin, admin as their credentials, and of course they get hacked. So make sure that there's strong passwords all over your organization, and uh, those passwords that are known to be leaked are not used. This applies to everyone in your organization. There is no exception for IT or anyone else. Uh, MFA, if strong password, uh, this is one of the best controls. Use multi-factor authentication whenever you can. It, it's going to help you a lot. 
segment your network. I briefly talked about this. Make sure that you limit your damage to one zone or two zones. Make sure that the ransomware doesn't spread your whole organization. Backups, I cannot stress how important this is uh, when it comes to whether it should be pay or should be not. Uh, backup is the solution. If you have the backups, you simply don't pay. Uh, you, sa you save yourself some millions. All those and most of those, the others are technology-based. One that not a lot of people talk is, is about the human factor and security. For years, we have believed that security is a technology problem. It's going to be solved just by technology. That's not completely wrong. That's not completely accurate as well. Uh, invest in all the best technologies in the world. You're still going to have one stupid guy in your team that's going to click on the phishing link. Well, sorry. You neglected people. So we need to spend time into educating our staff to understand what their role in security is. We have, they all play a role. Uh, they should be part of the team. So user awareness, user education, and stuff like that. Uh, dark web monitoring, that's, we're going into more advanced terms, but uh, this initial access, these things get sold in dark web and other, we talked with some of you about these kind of things being sold in Telegram and other, other sources. It doesn't have to be dark web, but monitoring these kind of sources that are being used by cyber criminals, it also, it's a good control. Intelligence-based security, which is the first slide I was talking about, understanding how these threat actors work. Uh, what kind of tools they use. Let's say this, one of those groups use this tool, a clone, whatever, for exfiltrating the data. And you see that tool in, in, in your environment and you have no idea what it is. But if you knew that the tool is used by this group for exfiltration, it could have stopped the group from stealing the data. So this is knowing yourself, but also knowing the hackers. If you know that you don't use the tool, combined but knowing that someone else, some group uses the tool, why don't you simply make a detection rule or a, a blocking rule and some of these things are solved. Uh, lastly, incident response plans. Worst comes to worst, you get hacked. Who do you call? Uh, physical words, we all know the name of the number of the emergency services. You get hacked today, who do you call? What is the number? Uh, you want to, 10 seconds, uh, you have to <laughs> talk to your employees how, if the email is working, it's not working, how do you, how do you communicate? Uh, things like that should be in part of uh, your incident response plan. I think I have used my time, uh, that, was <laughs> that was all for me, thank you very much.